Hey guys, it's me. Um, I just wanted to start out our uh, lecture on the rise of totalitarianism by staring at uh, the daily agendas for week three. So you guys can see right here, it says totalitarianism lecture. Um, in theory, you guys have already gone and watched the how to download into OneNote video. Um, you've already clicked on the PowerPoint and then eventually you'll see this online recording right there. So um, you've clicked on the PowerPoint, you've downloaded it, it's in your OneNote. And so you see it hanging out right there. And now what we're going to do is go through and do all of our annotations and make sure that we hopefully walk away understanding this just a little bit better. So um, mostly these annotations that you guys see right here are not necessary. Uh, visuals are just really powerful. So when we're staring at the title slide for Rise of Totalitarianism, I just have um, a pick from an old textbook I used to teach from of, um, of infamous and or famous people, but they're famous for a bad reason. So I labeled them here for you, starting out on the side on the left, you've got Mao Zedong in China. Um, I don't know who the guy is next to him, hence the question mark. You've got a bunch of unnamed soldiers and a tank. Um, I'm going from left to right. And then you see Vladimir Lenin in Russia. Next to him is going to be Winston Churchill. And he's going to be a prime minister uh, of England during World War II. Very, very famous prime minister. Um, then down here, you've got Chiang Kai-shek. He is going to uh, be from China. He's going to lose against Mao Zedong. And then he's going to become a leader of Taiwan. Um, then further to the right with that uh, fabulous salute is Benito Mussolini. And he is a dictator of Italy. And then right next to him is probably one of the most infamous men of all time, Adolf Hitler, the leader of Germany. Okay. And so then moving on down, we've got this map of Europe on September 1st, 1938. This is exactly one year earlier than World War II will begin. Um, this is the map that you guys have hopefully been studying and worrying about. You submitted uh, to Canvas last week. You have also um, been doing peer edits to help out your classmates because that quiz is this week. Okay. So um, here is, uh, I guess, the official start of the lecture on totalitarianism. So let's take a look at it. What does the word totalitarian actually mean? And honestly, um, when we're using our root words, right, our morphemes, total, really absolutely describes what totalitarian means pretty well. So an actual definition of totalitarian from the internet or a dictionary, exercising control over the freedom, the will, or the thought of others. And then there are other synonyms, right? Authoritarian and autocratic. And we both know, or we all know, that these are also synonyms for dictator, which is what we're looking at, right? Totalitarian is another word for a dictator. And basically, a totalitarian is a person who exercises control over others. Now, this is a terrible tongue twister, but I just want to make sure you guys know how to use each form of the word. So totalitarians, the person practice total oh my gosh totalitarianism the action or the verb in a totalitarian state another noun um so you can see the way that the, the uh excuse me that the word takes so when we're looking at totalitarian they take total control um they take total control over both your public and your private life so when we're looking at public life it's what you're allowed to do in the nation it's what the government or the person in charge says you're allowed to do and then they also take control of your private life because at the end of the day, you don't know who's a spy. You don't know who's who. So it really does control how you act, even in the privacy of your own home. So when we're looking at other qualities that a totalitarian government has, um, it is a political system. So it's a government. Okay. And that government 
is under one party control. And so that means only one political party is allowed at all. So the United States has a two party system where we are predominantly Democrats and we are predominantly Republicans. There are a couple of third party um, political parties here and there, but not enough to gain popularity. Um, but in a totalitarian state, everyone has to belong to that party. Um, maybe you guys have heard the rumor that Arnold Schwarzenegger, the famous actor and former governor of California, um, that his father was a Nazi. And when I hear that, I'm like, no, duh. His father lived in Austria during World War II Germany. He had to belong to that party. And if he didn't, he wouldn't have a job. Um, so he wouldn't be able to have work and pay his bills. Um, he honestly probably would have been thrown into a concentration camp and would have been killed. So everyone belonged to the political party because they had to, not because they wanted to. So that's really important to keep in the back of your mind when uh, you hear people say, well, they were Nazis. Everyone was a Nazi in 1930. Well, 1940 Germany. So uh, the leader recognizes no limits on their role. Uh, so very much like an absolute monarch, okay, without the form of a monarchy, right? Um, the leader also attempts to control every aspect of a person's public and private, uh, personal, public and personal life. And then this is also characterized by authoritarian rule where one person has all the authority. And so we have also known as, and I know if you guys were in the classroom with me right now, every single one of you would have screamed the word dictator out for me because I know you guys know this word really well. And so over here on the side, I just annotated other synonyms that we've used throughout the entire year. Autocrat, one ruler, authoritarian, or tyrant. Okay. Now, this slide is going to be very overwhelming. And the reason why it's overwhelming is because the amount of information that's typed into it. Um, but we're going to be constantly referring back to this, not just this week, but honestly, next week when we do chapter 10.2 and we talk about Joseph Stalin and we talk about Benito Mussolini, but also when we get into World War II and we talk about Adolf Hitler, we are going to constantly refer back to these seven aspects. So I highly recommend you guys practice writing out those seven aspects um, to kind of just keep them in your brain at all time. So um, all of these are explained in later slides. So I'm just going to read them out to you so you can hear me say them. Um, hopefully without yawning, sorry. And then um, you guys can replay this or come back to it as needed. So one of the first aspects or characteristics of a totalitarian government is a single party dictatorship. And so it's blind obedience to that leader through that political party. Um, you cannot belong to an opposition political party. You will either be shut down uh, you will be arrested, and if you don't promise to switch allegiances, uh, you will be put into a camp and then uh, killed uh, or worked to death. It just, it depends, okay? Um, honestly, one of the hardest of these seven aspects to, like, learn and understand is going to be number two, the second characteristic of a totalitarian state, and that's that your leader, that person, is a dynamic leader, and so that leader inspires the people to put the state first. So um, I have it on a, another slide where I can explain it better, uh, but it, it's about inspiring the people to become unified, either in pursuit of a goal like America first, okay, or it unifies people to... Um, to hunt down an enemy that is making the country weak. And so the most famous of all examples is Adolf Hitler saying that the Jews are what is making Germany as a nation fail. And so we must root them all out. And then what he really means very codedly is he's going to kill them all. So a dynamic leader unifies people behind this, uh, behind an idea. Um, and the idea is that the country is going to be saved. Okay. Um, you have state control of the society. Whenever you see state control, you can also just think government control. Um, and so this just means that the government's going to control 
what is allowed to exist in that nation. So what's happening in the economy, what are people producing, uh, what institutions are allowed to exist. So um, when we get to Russia next week, you'll see that Stalin decided that atheism was going to be his policy. So that means no church. So not only do Jews and Muslims not get to worship anywhere, but Christians as well will not be allowed, to, or Russian Orthodox will not be allowed to practice um, at all in Russia. So uh, the state controls what you're allowed to do, where you're allowed to go, because they're the ones that said that it's allowed to be there in the first place. Okay. Um, state control of the individual is also a little bit difficult um, to explain because I know every one of us sits at home and is like, mm, the government can't control me. I'm my own person. Um, but they give you rules, um, rules for how many children you can have or you should have, what you should be naming them, where you live, where you work. Um, it really is very suffocating. Um, and it is a very real thing. Um, I think it's just hard for us as Americans because we have never had that put on us. Um, although right now, state control of the society would be safer at home, right? Um, so, but that's the first time where we've seen this in our in our government or in our nation. So methods of enforcement. Um, these are ways of getting your people, your citizens to obey your rules and your laws. And so these are the use of police spies. Um, we already learned last week in Russian Revolution era, Vladimir Lenin, Russia, is he has the Cheka. Okay. Um, we're also going to use terror or fear to enforce the will of the state. Um, we're absolutely going to censor dissenters. So what that means is we are going to make sure that anyone who doesn't agree with us, a dissenter, um, doesn't get a platform for anyone to hear them. So they wouldn't be able to go onto the radio. They wouldn't have any books to publish. They wouldn't have any music to sing or to write. Like it's absolutely restriction of access to ideas. Okay. Um, another aspect of totalitarianism okay, is going to be modern technology. So that's using modern technology to either um, hurt the people. So we can look at this as weaponry, um, or we can also look at this as mass media or ways of indoctrinating and sending a message um, to our citizens to get them on the same page. And then the last one um, is ideology. Every single government, no matter what, has an ideology. Um, so right now, our government's ideology is safer at home. And then before that, we've got, you know, America first. And before that, we have hope. So every single presidency or time frame, there is an ideology or a belief system that we push out to you guys. And so that ideology or belief system can be easily pushed by schools and other youth organizations because that's when trusted adults have access to children who, in theory, trust them a lot. Um, and so if I'm saying the same thing as a TV commercial, um, then basically you get indoctrinated to have this, oh, I, I should believe in um, covering my face and not touching my face and washing my hands for at least 20 seconds and coughing into my elbow. Um, ideologies don't have to be good or bad. They can just be. Um, but some obviously can be a little bit more harmful than others, like Adolf Hitler's ideology um, that the Jews were the root of all evil in Germany and must be destroyed. Um, so those are the seven characteristics. And once again, practice them, practice looking at them, practice saying them, really list them out. And I know that's very archaic, um, but the stuff that I would do with you in class is very different than what I'm doing with you online. So just kind of keep that one in mind. Now, here are some key words when we are talking about uh, to remembering um, totalitarianism. And I started to like draw connections from like, okay, well, ideology, which is also an aspect of uh, totalitarianism, how does that relate to state control of the society, state control of the individual, modern technology, methods of enforcement? And then as you guys can see, it's like, oh, it interrelates with all of them. So I, I stopped uh, at the third one. Now down here below, 
um, I decided that I was going to write out very explicit definitions because some of these words are on your vocabulary quiz. So I wanted to give you no doubt of what those words mean. Um, but I also just wanted to clarify. So we've got ideology is just a belief system. Uh, propaganda is information that is potentially or especially biased. And that's used to promote a particular point of view. Um, so we can use that to either support something or to um, show that we don't agree with it. Mass media, I think, is the most, um, if you guys look at it online, it's literally just media. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm defining this for you. It's a phrase used to describe TV, radio, movies, social media. But honestly, that list keeps going because we have um, a lot of different types of technology that can reach tons of people easily. And when you want to reach the people, aka the masses, you do it in such a broad way, right? So um, you guys probably don't listen to the radio anymore, but you guys definitely listen to Spotify and those have ads. And so those ads um, would be a part of that mass media campaign. Um, if you guys drive, you guys see on the sides of the freeway, safer at home, COVID-19. Um, you've got TV. I know that you guys don't watch like regular TV, but Netflix, if you guys have commercials on Hulu, if you guys have commercials on any other streaming pro um, program or uh, app, uh, app. Um, that's how mass media can get to you. Um, same thing with like movies, social media. And I hope you guys all know by now, um, people are watching what you're watching and they have analytics based on that. And then they give you future suggestions based on what you're watching. Um, and that's also, uh, the school's problem with zoom, right? Is that zoom is selling your information to companies like Facebook. And that was the government's problem with Facebook is that they were selling information that they were collecting to other companies. Um, so mass media is just looking at any possible way that anyone could use media um, to get in contact with people and brainwash them or influence them. Uh, single political party, we already talked about that. I'm going to hold off on the per, uh, personality cult because that's the next slide and it's like really good job. Uh, state terrorism is very, very... Uh, very frightening. Um, it's when the government supports the violence against its citizens. Um, and we're going to see in Russia and Italy and Germany that that's going to happen a lot. Um, mass surveillance isn't something that you guys are potentially used to, but it's usually when a government is watching you or spying on their own citizens. So, um, but it could also just be very publicly well known. So if you guys have ever gone to England, you have CCTV, which is closed captioning TV, but it, they're just cameras everywhere in public watching your every move. Um, not because they think you're going to do something, but it's recording you in case something happens and they can go back later. Um, and then you've got restriction, which just means limiting. Um, and so as you guys can see, I took like, oh, how does this belief system relate to these keywords? So you've got state control of society. Well, that's going, the ideology or the... Hey guys, sorry um, if the editing between this video and the other one I try and merge it with isn't fantastic. You would never believe it. The school laptop uh, shut down on me in the middle of my recording. Who would have thunk it? So where we left off, I was trying to explain that a belief system is a part of controlling society. Um, because it tells them what to think. And then that same ideology is used to control the individual in the privacy of their own home. Um, and that ideology is also going to come down here and be a part of the methods of enforcement. Because if you're telling people they have to do this or believe this or participate in this, that's another way of enforcing um, whatever your belief system is on not just that one person, because now they're practicing what you preach, but they're doing it in front of everyone. So everyone thinks they are also, um, practicing what the government is preaching. So, um, each one of these is going to be multifaceted, just meaning that it can be used in a lot of different of those seven aspects of a totalitarian government. So moving on, 
Um, in the last uh, slide or two, we were talking about like, hey, what does a dynamic leader look like? And I was like, oh, I have a slide that can explain it better than, you know, me just talking about it. And this is that slide. So this is going to be aspect number two. Um, and so that dynamic leader unites the nation. And just like the example that I gave in historical context, um, Hitler didn't actually say Jews are bad, but Hitler, that was his general theme. Um, and so he united Germany in the 1930s behind the idea of anti-Semitism. Um, and we can look at Lenin and Stalin, um, not that this is a direct quote from them either, but uh, capitalism is bad um, because Lenin is trying to get Russia to get on, I guess, the same page that he's on, um, overthrow the czar and become a communist state. Um, then you've got Stalin is saying capitalism is bad because he wants to prove that um, the United States and Western Europe are his enemy. So he's uniting his people for this common goal, um, which is come together and make our country strong. Um, and then in the case of Hitler, actually, and Stalin, you're uniting them against an enemy. Now, on top of it, this totalitarian and this dynamic leadership is going to be very charismatic. And so when you're charismatic, that means you're a great speaker, um, it's really easy to feel comfortable around you um, and you want to listen to them. Um, in the video section under the Unit 7 resources, I have um, one or two clips of Adolf Hitler giving a speech. Not that I expect you guys to understand German, but just to see how the crowd reacts to him um, because he was unfortunately very charismatic. Um, in your lifetime, um, you guys might have seen some speeches made by uh, former President Barack Obama. He's a very charismatic speaker, even if you don't agree with his politics. Um, his cadence, like the way that he spoke, um, his hand movements, gesticulations, and everyone in the audience was drawn to pay attention. Um, and your parents' generation... Uh, someone who was also an equally charismatic president was uh, former president Bill Clinton. Very, very charismatic. Um, now, a part of that dynamic leadership is developing a cult of the personality or a personality cult around yourself. And so you have a brand that must be maintained. Um, I, if we were in uh, my classroom right now, I would use that poster of me um, and Joseph Stalin in the back, uh, one of the brand things that he had was that mustache. You can always tell the mustache. Um, him and Hitler had a very particularly distinguishing mustache. So it's this brand that you must visually support as well as support with your actions. Um, you make sure that you get an emotional tie between the leader and their people. Um, Adolf Hitler has a lot of photos where he's giving little girls flowers. Um, Joseph Stalin, same thing. You want to engage um, with your audience. Um, politicians do this. They kiss babies. Um, they make sure that they go to um, state, uh, state, um, oh, son of a gun, state, um, I can't even think of it. It's, um, they're not conventions, but you go and you, you know, kiss babies and eat corn or whatever was deep fried. Oh, bah humbug. So, um, and then you want people to want to be you, right? You want everyone to think that your life is super great and amazing. Um, and so everyone wants to grow up to be like you and you want to be able to be personable while still being extraordinary. So um, ordinary and relatable, but extraordinary. And so I don't know if your parents have allowed you to watch uh, Joe Exotic, but I feel like Joe Exotic definitely has a personality cult. Um, he has a brand that he is maintaining with his crazy, outrageous behavior, but also visually with his mullet and his bleach blonde hair and his piercings. Um, he creates an emotional tie between him and his workers because they're there to care for the animals. Um, people want to be like him. He had those music videos and 
those uh, photos and like him blowing up stuff and like video channels. So he was getting people to be like, oh man, I want to be just like him. Um, and he could still seem ordinary and relatable because he's falling in love and getting married just like you, even though it was a little bit different. Uh, you know, so like Joe Exotic is my contemporary pop culture reference. Um, ooh, ooh, State Fair. State Fair. That's what I was talking about and could not remember. The State Fairs where politicians go and eat, you know, corn and deep fried Snickers. Bah All right. So anyway, that's the cult of uh, personality and what a dynamic leader looks like. Um, sorry for the random segue in the middle of it. So now we're going to discuss what um, state control of society looks like, um, how a government can actually control uh, society, which actually seems really hard, but it's actually pretty easy. Um, when we're talking about schools, uh, you make laws about what is allowed to be taught by law. In Hitler's um, Germany, you were taught very specifically that Jews, Jewish people were a different race and that race was inferior. They actually taught little kids genetics. Um, they used uh, little kids books to teach anti-Semitism. Um, in my classroom, I have that picture of Stalin. I've got actually pro-communist uh, paraphernalia everywhere because I'm trying to teach you that communism is amazing because I want to become a communist dictator one day. Um, but in the state of California, we still have what's allowed to be taught by law. Um, it's very easy to legislate that kind of stuff. Um, when we're looking at religion, um, what kind of religion is allowed in your country? In 1936 to 1944 Germany, you did not have synagogues. Um, in fact, they started to be burned down by uh, 1938. Um, when we're looking uh, in Stalin's Russia, he allowed no religion. Everyone was forced to become atheists. So um, just because the government um, banned it didn't mean that it didn't happen. People practiced privately in their own homes, but that was very, very, very risky. So if the state, like in Italy, only allows Catholicism to be practiced, um, then that's the only religion that you could practice publicly. Um, and then looking at business and economics, uh, does the government own and operate those resources? Um, who do they allow to own things? Are they um, discriminating against a particular group of people, a religion, an ethnicity, a race? Um, does the government have any economic goals or plans? Uh, Joseph Stalin is going to have a couple of plans. Um, so is Vladimir Lenin. And they're going to say which businesses are allowed to produce and be open right now and how much of, you know, how many spatulas are going to get made or how many televisions are going to get made. That's absolute state control of society. Now, I realized as I was going through, when I was doing state control of the individual, this was left blank because I wanted to fill it out with you guys because I wanted to talk about all these really cool things that are really offensive. Um, with you. And so um, the state can control you as a person because they can tell you where you're allowed to live. Um, so for those of you who have heard about places called Jewish ghettos, those were areas of cities where Jews were not only allowed to live, but they were forced to live. Um, you have uh, countries all over the world that still do that to particular uh, populations that they have. Um, the government will also control who you marry and what age you get married at. So once again, racism, um, classism, this is looking at making sure you, um, so in, in Germany, you had Jews were not allowed to marry non-Jews and non-Jews could not marry Jews. Um, and if you were married, they would dissolve your marriage. Um, and then at what age must you marry by? Um, we need to make sure that we're using women for their good reproductive years. Um, they also tell you how many kids you should be having because those kids are going to be able to fight for the motherland or the fatherland, whichever country it is you're fighting for. Um, Hitler and Mussolini gave medals to women who would have excessive amounts of children. Um, I want to say there's a story in your textbook about an Italian mom with uh, 12 kids who was personally 
personally given a medal by Mussolini because she was helping to fight the good fight with her future generation of children. Um, what you name your kids. Um, Hitler actually had an approved list. Um, and there's a cartoon that I have in uh, Unit 7 or Unit 8 resources uh, that was actually made by Disney that actually makes fun of this um, because you couldn't name your children most things out of the um, out of the, uh, the the testament um, the first half of the Bible because those were Jewish names uh, but you could name them good uh, good solid Christian names um the information that you share with people because are they a spy do you know you really don't um and then it also kind of controls what kind of job you have or what you're allowed to have um they do want you working obviously but it's what you're doing um, with that time as well so there are ways for the government to control you as an individual in your own home behind closed doors because if you say something nasty about the government and your kids hear it, your children are taught to inform on you to their teachers or to other secret police. So you're not free in your own home. Um, when we look here at this particular um, visual, it's just reminding you that the government is going to be supreme over all. Your church is going to come second. Your family comes second. The economy is going to be dictated by the state. Schools dictated media. Everything is dictated by the government, and they're the ones that are in charge. Um, so here we have totalitarianism in your life. Um, do totalitarians exist in your everyday lives? And the truth is absolutely yes. Um, even democratic governments have totalitarian qualities. And hopefully that's something that we get to discuss a little bit later. Um, but totalitarians exist in your parents, in your teachers, in your coaches, in police officers. Um, in anyone who controls what you're doing in your own home and then uh, in public places. Uh, yeah, we, we all do have totalitarians. So um, every year Parade Magazine publishes a list of you know, the 10 worst dictators that we've got. So um, this is obviously very old and all of these guys are uh, dead, but infamous, okay? When we remember what infamous means, um, it means that you're famous for a bad reason and so we're just going to go uh, over famous for a bad reason. We're just going to go over a couple of really infamous totalitarian dictators that are going to come up not only through our uh, unit of study, but in other classes as well. So uh, Fidel Castro is someone who is cited a lot as a famous communist uh, dictator. Um, his brother Raul is now in charge as Castro died in 2016. Um, we don't really know why he died, although we think it's cancer. Um, the United States tried to kill him a lot, especially in the 1960s, and we were just really good at failing. So um, he clearly lived on. Um, and so he led the Cuban revolution against the previous dictator that the United States had supported. Um, and then we did not have a good relationship with him. Uh, President Obama just lifted the embargo or the forbidden, um, uh, we were not, we were no longer allowed to trade with Cuba for about 50 years. Um, but he's definitely someone who's very important in United States history. You'll spend a lot of time talking about him. Um, another infamous or famous for a bad reason, uh, dictator is Kim Jong-il. Kim Jong-il is also dead. He died in 2011. Um, he had a very suspicious heart attack, which is really interesting because his third son who came to power, Kim Jong-un, who is the current leader, also actually had his older brother assassinated uh, within the last year or two. So, hmm, question there. But uh, Kim jong Il was uh, very mentally unstable. Um, you guys can look him up and he was really into the film industry, really into music and directing. They even made a very crass rated R film that you should absolutely not watch uh, about him called Team America. It's with uh, marionettes and it's made by the same guys that do uh, South Park. Um, and then his son, Kim Jong-un, is also the subject of the film with uh, that just came out uh, called, I wanna say The Dictator. Um, and I can't remember the actors right now, but they'll, they'll come to me when I'm in the middle of a really good point. So this family has been um, 
in pop culture a lot. Um, but yeah, so our president uh, refers to him as Rocket Man because uh, not uh, Kim Jong Un, but his son. Uh, Kim Jong Un, so sorry, um, refers to Kim Jong Un as Rocket Man, um, and then you can always go to the World Tourist Dictators and check out who we've got. But um, I'm almost done with this. We just have a quick history of totalitarians, and then kind of like a preview of what we're going to do, and then we're all set. So um, the quick history of the phrase totalitarianism or what a totalitarian is, um, is going to surface after World War I. Um, most of Europe was absolutely devastated. Um, I'm skipping this part in our textbook in 10.1, but it talks about how the Great Depression happens and becomes a global problem. Um, sadly, what we're going through right now with Safer at Home this will probably be something in your lifetime that you see firsthand or that we all see firsthand. Um, but during this time in the 19, late 1920s and then all of the 1930s, Europe is devastated. Democracies are falling apart. Countries are falling apart. You have riots. You have many revolutions. Um, some countries are really upset with the conditions of the surrender of Germany in World War I. Um, and at a certain point, Germany couldn't afford to pay reparations anymore. They had got stuck with that really high bill, $33 billion. And at a certain point, because of the Great Depression, they stopped paying on their debts. And so France became really upset about this and then is going to occupy a part of their land and steal natural resources. And it, it really isn't positive, but we'll get into it in our next unit. Um, and at the same time, some countries are falling victim to large movements um, that are characterizing themselves as nationalist. And when you see something called a nationalist movement, that's usually code for we like the F the the dominant ethnicity of this country and all minorities are the problem. Um, and so you see that in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Austria, where they're going to become a lot more authoritarian, a lot more racist, um, a lot more negative. So the major totalitarians that we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks, obviously you have Adolf Hitler. Um, I am recording this on 420. Um, and I just want you guys to take note that his birthday, he was born on April 20th. Um, and then his death, uh, suicide anniversary is coming up in about 10 days. It's going to be April 30th. Um, so this is just a preview for World War II. He's going to be talked about a lot in chapter 10.3 and chapter 11. Um, but he is a totalitarian dictator of Germany from 1933 until 1945 when he kills himself. Um, and during his time, he annexes or adds Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland to the empire of Germany um, before starting World War war uh, two and in his uh tenure as a as a dictator he systematically eliminated 11 million people in the holocaust alone six million of those are jewish and then the other five million are other ethnicities or political groups or minorities that he wanted to exterminate um so the next one that we talked about last week was Vladimir Lenin. Um, we know that he overthrew Nicholas II, the czar of Russia in 1917, or he actually overthrew Alexander Kerensky, leader of the provisional government in 1917, um, and then went on to fight the Russian Civil War until he could take power for himself as the Bolshevik communist leader of Russia. And this is where totalitarianism really gets its start. Um, and then he dies. So sad. Um, and then the next guy to come into power um, that is going to perfect totalitarianism alongside with Hitler, because he also perfects it, is going to be Joseph Stalin. Um, he sadly too dies of a stroke, um, and he's going to be the uncontested leader of Russia or uh, from 1929 um, until his death in 1953. And he is known for killing about 
40 million of his own people, 10 million alone in something called the Great Purge, but he kills up to 40 million of his own people. Um, so we're going to cover him in more detail in chapter 10, section two or lesson two. And then the last guy that I want to briefly mention that's also going to be in chapter 10, lesson two is Benito Mussolini. Okay, so Benito Mussolini. Um, he's going to become uh, the fascist dictator of Italy uh, in the 1920s, and he's going to be executed in 1945. Um, he is the one who is guilty of inspiring Adolf Hitler to perfect um, this new type of totalitarianism called fascism. Um, and I uh, can't wait to talk to you guys about this guy. But uh, fun fact, his granddaughter is in Italian parliament today. And there is an article in your resource tab uh, that shows the Twitter war she had with Jim Carrey, um, famous comedian. Um, so yeah. So um, just to end on that note, um, these are the totalitarians of the past that we're going to be looking at. Totalitarianism is a movement um, that took hold in the 1920s because of terrible economic conditions. And it is something that uh, sadly even continues today um, in Korea, in Cuba, all over the world. Don't even get me started about Africa. But totalitarianism is definitely something that is uh, a part of your everyday life and you don't even know it. And once again, I just want to uh, end on these seven characteristics of a totalitarian state because this is 100% what we will be working with, with for the next or the last six, seven weeks of school. So please make sure you understand what a single party dictatorship is, a dynamic leader, what that looks like or what that means, and then state control of the society, state control of the individual, um, methods of enforcement, modern technology, and what an ideology is. It's super, super, super important. Um, miss you guys. I hope this makes sense. And if it doesn't, uh, please, please, please send me an email or I will see you in one of the Canvas conferences. Miss you. Bye.